Hello everybody, it's time to geek out again. So, very recently, a YouTuber who I really love to watch because he has such brainy, you know, uh, such um, brainy sciencey content, Veritasium, posted a recent video titled Four Revolutionary Riddles. And, uh, well, I decided to, you know, essentially make another Geek Out episode where I answer his riddles. So, before I get started, what I'm going to do is I'm going to link his video up there in the little card and also down in the description. What I want you to do is I want you to go and watch that video first. I'll wait right here for just a few quiet seconds for you to return. And once you come back, if you want to try and answer those riddles for yourself, well, just keep this video paused. Try to answer those riddles for yourself for a second. And if you get stumped, well, come right back here and just watch. Okay, now that you're back to see my answers to these riddles, let's get started. So, riddle number one, Veritasium starts off with just a simple little ramp. Just like, oops, just like this. So, you know, he starts off, you know, with a simple unassuming little ramp like that. And he rolls a roll of tape, you know, straight down. So, you know, as a roll of tape, it just goes straight down to the end of the ramp just to show that he's not doing anything funny with the ramp itself. But then he takes a nondescript black box, so to speak, or in this case, a black cylinder, and he tries to roll it down the ramp, and it, stop, and it basically stops at first, wiggles a little, and then just starts very slowly easing its way down the ramp, very counterintuitively. I have, I have the reason why. And the reason for that, I'm going to draw this cylinder essentially in mid-descent, is that it is effectively filled with a viscous fluid. A viscous fluid resists flow. That's basically what viscosity is. It's the propensity of a fluid to resist flowing. Um, examples of this would be that water and gasoline, for example, have extremely low viscosities. Gasoline actually has an even lower viscosity than water because it more readily wets surfaces and spreads out across surfaces, whereas water doesn't do this quite so easily. More viscous substances would include, for example, uh, corn syrup or, hun or uh, honey or even heated pitch. Well, heated up to the point where it's actually liquid. Well, actually, no. I take that back. Pitch is actually liquid at room temperature. Uh, if you look up the pitch experiment, I'll actually put a link down in the description. Um, it actually proves that pitch is liquid at room temperature, but it is currently the most viscous natural substance known to man. Um, and seriously, go, re go read about the pitch experiment. I gotta, I'll have a link down there for you to read. But that's basically... The first riddle is he just has a little jar or canister or something filled with an extremely viscous fluid inside, and this extremely viscous fluid basically resists the uh, canister's uh, um, propensity to roll down the ramp with the assistance of gravity. So that's riddle number one. Riddle number two. Veritasium starts off with a bicycle, and this is going to be a very crudely drawn bicycle. Uh, let's see here, so, it's a very, very crudely drawn bicycle, like that. So he starts off with a bicycle, and he has a string tied to a pedal, like that, and he pull, and he says, he's going to pull backwards on the string, and he wants to know what's going to happen to the bicycle when he pulls, pulls on the string. Will it move forward or stay stationary or will nothing happen at all? There is an unspoken variable in this particular riddle. Veritasium makes no mention of the gearing ratio between the pedals and between the uh, front and rear sprockets of the bike. This is actually very, 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 very important, especially on bicycles with multiple gearing ratios. 
Um, it also is very important to know whether or not it's a mountain bike or a road bike because road bikes have very different gearing ratios than mountain bikes do. But we are going to go under the assumption that the bicycle he's working with is a mountain bike at its lowest possible gearing ratio. So that means that you basically have the chain on the smallest sprocket up front and the biggest sprocket in the rear. So it'll look kind of sort of like that, right? When you do that, I'm just going to draw the pedal assembly here. Just like that. Very crudely drawn. So when he pulls on the string, pulls straight back like this, because this bicycle, again, I'm making the assumption it's on its lowest gearing ratio possible already. When he pulls back on the string, this pedal right here will actually trace an arc like this. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to propel the bicycle forward slightly until the pedal reaches this point, at which point the bike will stop. That's my prediction of what's going to happen with the second riddle. The third riddle, you start around a racetrack, right? And you mosey about at a nice leisurely pace. It doesn't matter what you're, doesn't matter how fast you walk, you just mosey around at a leisurely pace, right? And then you, and then you suddenly change your speed much faster so that by the time you're done with your second lap around the track, your average speed is double what your first speed was. This riddle actually has the answer in it. So we're going to use some variables here. We're going to start off with V1, the first speed you start at. Doesn't matter what the speed is, so we're using a variable. And then there is a second, there's a uh, second velocity. So for your second lap, you run at V2, just like that. And you end up with an average speed that is double what V1 is. How do you how does this happen? Well, it's right here. That's literally the answer to the problem right there. When you take the average of some when you take the average of a list of values, for example, you add them all up and then you divide them by the number of values. Just like that. So for example, if we have, you know, velocity one plus velocity two plus dot 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 plus velocity in, you then divide that by in gives you V average. So I think it was a little off frame there. So let's do a little bit of average. Let, pfft, sorry. Let's do a little bit of algebra. So we have V1 plus V2 all over two to give us our average is equal to 2v1, right? So we need to know what v2 is. So first we do v1 plus v2 is equal to 2 times 2v1. So we multiply both sides by 2, just like that. And that cancels this out. So we have v1 plus v2 over here. So this gives v1 plus v2 is equal to 4v1, just like that. Then we have to subtract v1 from both sides. So, and that basically cancels that out. So we have v2 is equal to 3v1. Your second speed must be thrice your first speed in order for your average speed to equal twice your first speed. V2 is equal to 3V1. You have to quite literally sprint three times faster than you walk. And trust me, you know, the average human, I believe, plods along at about one to two miles an hour or something like that. You know, which is a nice, I think it's like a nice brisk walking pace. You basically almost have to, you have to almost sprint along at, you know, six-ish miles per hour, give or take in order to pull this off. But it is physically possible for the average person to pull this off around a closed loop track. Just as long as you start off as, at a nice leisurely plod at first. Riddle number four. 
This is the one that really baked my noodle. This is the one that really made me sit and think. And, you know, if you were following along, you know, there's actually a little bit of a hint in a couple, in, you know, one or two of these other riddles here. But we're going to just focus purely on the fourth riddle. The fourth riddle states that on any train, any given train, there is always a part of the train that is moving backwards with respect to the ground. This is a bit of a curiosity. The wording is a bit of a curiosity, and it actually gave me pause for a moment because, you know, wait a minute, if a train is moving forward, what part of it is moving backwards relative to the ground? Well, let's first make an assumption and look at a slight variation of this problem. What parts of a train are moving backwards relative to the train? Mm, this is this is where things can get kind of interesting. So first, let's look at a frame of reference fixed um, that basic. Let's look at a moving frame of reference, or rather, rephrase that. Let's look at a frame of reference that is stationary with respect to the motion of the train. And let's look at a locomotive wheel set. All right, so we have a wheel and an axle, just like that, right? Now, with respect to the train, or with respect to the forward movement of the train, there are numerous parts of a train that are moving backwards. For instance, the entire lower half of every single wheel set from here to here is all moving backwards with respect to the forward motion of the train itself, right? So there's plenty of parts of a train that move backwards relative to the frame of reference of the train itself because when you're actually on the train, and this is a very this is a very important physics distinction. When you're actually moving with the train, the frame of reference of the train is stationary, which means these parts of the wheels are actually moving forwards with respect to the train or with respect to the movement of the train, and the lower half of every single wheel set is moving backwards. So I thought, you know what? This would be a good place to start to find a solution for this because I actually had to sit here and sketch this out to find the solution. So let's start here. You know, maybe if I go barking up this tree, I'll probably find the solution hanging amongst the branches. So I took my frame of reference of the train and I modified my perspective slightly. And what I did was I actually used two frames of reference in my head to find the solution. So first off, I started with, I'm actually going to draw this right here. I'm going to draw another wheel and axle. Now, a very important thing about locomotive wheel sets is that the, um, actually, you know what, I'm going to start on another page for this because this is already getting big. So we have number four. So we have our wheel, axle. So, you know, crudely sketched or crudely resketched version of the problem. So basically, an important thing to note about trains is that the wheel set in railroading parlance is actually effectively a single solid piece that rotates all as one unit. So for example, you know, we have uh, you have uh, one rail right here. And that's a badly drawn rail that would not that would obviously not be used as a rail in real life and neither would this. But you have your rails, you have your wheels. Just like that. And you have your axle. And then extending slightly beyond the wheel, of course, is the roller bearing. Or rather, it's more of a friction type bearing, but you know, it's beside the point. But this entire unit 
you know, axle, wheels, everything rotates as a single, uh, single unit. It's all connected together. The wheels do not rotate freely with respect to the axle. This is why trains have the load bearing capabilities they do, because this is quite literally just effectively just a solid block as far as the physics is concerned. This is just a solid unit. So from there, I decided, you know what, I'm going to take that little bit of knowledge about the wheel set. I'm going to use a couple of different frames of reference all in one picture. So we start off with a wheel, just like that, and we draw an axle in the middle. This is actually where I started with my sketch, by the way, was with a wheel and axle sitting on a rail. So the frame of reference that I'm that I started with in my head was a frame of reference affixed to the axis of rotation of the entire wheel set. So punching straight through the center of the wheel, punching through the axis of rotation of the axle. And then I took that and moved it to a stationary frame of, or I moved it to a stationary frame of reference on the ground. And I took those two frames of references and I combined them together. And so I started with a point on the rim of the wheel, just like this, also known as the tread in railroading parlance because it, well, it's the part of the tire, which is, tiny, which is a thin little band of steel pressed onto the, um, pressed onto the um, edge of the wheel. Um, but I took a, took a point on the tread where it meets the rail and I thought, well, what path would that point trace relative to my fixed frame of reference on the ground, my fixed perspective on the ground? And it actually ends up tracing this kind of path right here. Just like that. And, you know, I thought, well, that's all nice and everything. You know, it's got these really neat nifty little cusps where, you know, the tread makes contact with the wheel, each rotation, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, there's no part of the tread that moves backwards with respect to the ground because, well, at each point where it makes a nice little cusp, it's stationary with respect to the ground. Close, but no cigar. So I thought, okay, what if there's a part in the axle that does it? So took a part, took a point on the axle at the same starting position. And I thought, well, what kind of path will this trace? Okay, well, I followed along and I'll end up tracing this kind of path. Just like that. And I thought, okay, well, I mean, that's, no, nah, that's not even remotely close at all. But, you know, I think, I'm, I think I might be getting somewhere. So I sat and I thought for a moment and well, I thought there must be a part of the wheel set that actually does move backwards with respect to the ground. And if you don't know too terribly much about the, I guess, I guess you could say design of locomotive wheel sets, or rather if you don't know anything at all about the design of locomotive wheel sets, because you know, this is, this little bit of design is actually pretty common knowledge. There's a tiny little part of the wheel that actually extends a little bit below or a little bit beyond the radius of the tread. And that is the flange. And the flange serves one simple little purpose. It keeps the wheel set from, you know, dropping right off the rails. And the flange extends ever so slightly beyond the radius of the tread, just like that. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to trace the path of a point on the on the uh, edge of the flange. So I sat there and I was like, you know what? I'm actually going to take this and I'm going to follow the same curve that this point along the tread follows but I'm going to keep this distance from that. And lo and behold, looky there. Look at that and wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Boom, backwards movement, just like that. In other words, the flanges on the wheels 
are the part of a train that moves backwards with respect to the ground. And so that's the solution to the fourth riddle. And so I sat here and I looked at it for a moment and I thought, these are some funky little curves. I remember seeing this, I remember seeing curves like this before. And indeed I have, because I actually looked up this first curve that I traced, this one right here in the middle. I actually looked that up and it is a, uh, and the name escapes me at the moment. Uh, give me just a brief moment. I actually have to look that up. Okay, I'm back. I actually had to look it up because uh, I had a brain fart. But it traces a curve called a cycloid. And what, what you get with a cycloid is basically if you take a line like that and you take a circle, right? And you roll this circle along the line just like that without any slippage whatsoever and you trace the path drawn by a point on the circumference of the circle. The path that it traces out is a cycloid. Now, there are two other forms of this curve because a cycloid has another more generic name. It is also known as the common trochoid. And trochoids, or a trochoid is basically what all three of these curves are. And in fact, you also have two other kinds of trochoids. Uh, this first one here, the one that I traced off for the axle, is the, shoot, I have to look at it, turn it all up again. My memory is failing me, and I did not prepare for this video at all. A curtite, a curtate trochoid. So that's what this term is, or that's what this, you know, nice, graceful little curve is. What happens with a curtate trochoid is, well, essentially, let's say we have an imaginary circle that we're rolling smoothly across a line without slippage, but we're actually tracing a point on, a, on the circumference of a circle of smaller radius. The curve that it traces is a curtate, is a curtate trochoid. This also happens when you take a circle of radius r and you rotate it so that it actually slips faster than it's rotating along the line. So in other words, its forward moment, its forward velocity um, is effectively greater than the velocity it would have at its current, at its um, present angular momentum. And this third curve right here, the one that is so special, that parts of it actually move backwards with respect to, you know, the motion of the main circle. Is the prolate trochoid. And that's basically what this special little trochoid is. And I'm going to have links to Wikipedia articles about the cycloid and the trochoid down in the description. So, you know, be sure to click through those and read through those articles. They're a little bit dense on the math. Ignore the math. Just look at the look at the graphics. You know they're really nicely they're really nicely made graphics. But now you know what I'm going to take this opportunity to geek out a little bit more, particularly about the cycloid because the cycloid has some really spiffy, nifty, neat little properties. I'm going to start another page for this because why the heck not? Cycloids. So, the cycloid is the solution to two really cool little problems. The parkistochrone and the tautochrone. 
So what is the Burkista Chrome problem and what is the Tato Chrome problem? Well, for that, I'm actually going to lead you over to Vsauce because Vsauce actually made a really cool video about the Burkista Chrome problem. Again, you know, I have a link up there and down in the description. Please watch that video. He does a much better job of explaining it than I probably will, but because I'm geeking out right now, I'm going to talk about the Burkista Chrome and the Tata Chrome problem and how the cycloid is a solution to both of these. So the Burkista Chrome problem is a problem where you have two points, let's say A and uh, so let's say A and B, right? And you want to find the curve that can basically allow an object to move from A to B the fastest. Hmm? Now, most people would probably start off with a straight line, right? And you know, a straight line works, except this is actually not the most efficient solution. Some people would think, oh, well, you start with you start with a vertical drop and then you suddenly curve it into a flat line so that you know whatever is dropping you know won't slow down all that much because you know it's still going down a flat slope or because it's traveling along a flat surface and you know this will this will actually get you from a to b a little bit faster than a straight line but it's not the most efficient solution our good old friend the cyclone it, the cyclone the cycloid is the most efficient solution to this problem just like that, you basically start at the cusp and you use a part of a cycloid. It doesn't even matter how much of the cycloid you use. This is the crazy part. As long as you use slightly more than half of the cycloid curve, it doesn't matter how much you use as long as you start at a cusp so it starts vertical and then goes horizontal briefly and then comes back up to point B just like this this cycloid curve will actually get your falling object to point B first. And, you know, again, also a link to a Wikipedia article about the Brachista Chrome problem down in the description. Um, it also has some nice animations about it, but this is the Brachista Chrome. And this problem works even if, and this is the, this is the mind boggling part, even if A and B are exactly the same level. Clearly, you know, a flat line won't work. A vertical drop, well, I mean, this ain't going to work at all. You know, I mean, if you look at this, you know, your thing falls straight down and it actually loses momentum because it will actually slow down going across this flat bit and it'll only go up so far before it just comes right back. But if you use a cycloid just like this, a full cycloid, just like that, and of course, assuming, you know, no, and of course, assuming, you know, no no uh, fric no friction with the surface you know like for example if you're only experiencing air resistance or something like that your falling object from point a will actually arrive at point b using a cycloid this is the funky part about the brachista chrome is it actually works if a and b are the same level so now let's talk about the tato chrome the tato chrome also uses a cycloid because the tato chrome the problem states find a curve such that if you have two points A and B that you can start drop that you can start an object at any point along the curve and it will always arrive at point B after exactly the same period of time so you could start an object you know very close to B and it will arrive at point B in X seconds and you could start your object very close to point A, and it will still arrive at point B after X seconds. Clearly, a straight line does not suffice. But what does suffice is a half of a cycloid. So if we take a full cycloid like this, and I'm only drawing approximations, and we cut it straight in half just like that, and we connect to point A and point B right there, just like that, we have created a Tato Crone curve. You can start your object right here. You can start your object right here, right here, right here at point A. You could start it, you know, very close to point A. You could start it right here up against point B, assuming zero friction. And all of these 
will arrive at point B at exactly the same time. And once again, Vsauce, and actually here's the really cool part about the Vsauce video, is he also does this in partnership with Adam Savage of the, of the Mythbusters, because Adam Savage loves working with, you know, stuff like this and actually building, like physically building solutions to problems like this. Seriously, you know, go check, you know, go check out Vsauce's video about the Brachista Crone and the Tatra Crone. It's such a cool video to watch. I highly recommend it. But yeah, this is me geeking out about this because that fourth riddle was just like it it basically lit up a whole bunch of light bulbs all at once and then I then you know I was reading then I was rereading about cycloids because you know I first learned about them from you know Brachista Crone and Tata Crone pro problems and it just rekindled a whole lot of geekery in me so yeah that's basically what this that's basically the solution to the fourth riddle right there is a very special trochoid called the prolate trochoid where we 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 you know it just does that whole number so yeah that's my response to veritasium's four revolutionary riddles and uh so yeah thanks for watching bye